Hello and welcome to chapter 12, Forest, Forest Management, and Protected Areas. So basically by the end of this video, you're going to want to have a very good understanding of basically everything that has to do with forests, uh, how to manage them, the resources with them, uh, and the problems that they face. Alright, now let's take a look at the different types of forests. So uh, in chapter 4, we actually went over all of these types, but uh, the book lists them again, so I just wrote them again. So here we have the boreal, the tropical rainforest, the temperate deciduous, temperate rainforest, tropical dry, and the woodlands. And again, uh, we already went over those pretty in-depth in Chapter 4, so you can refer back to that video if you have any extra questions. Okay, let's look at forest benefits. So, essentially, when healthy, uh, forests are an excellent platform for biodiversity. And uh, as we know from our last video, biodiversity is a good thing, and that's uh, probably the best uh, attribute that any ecosystem could have. Next, let's take a look at ecosystem services. So basically, anything that the forest provides for us. So think about how they prevent erosion, they prevent runoff, they filter pollutants, they do photosynthesis, photosynthesis excuse me, they store carbon. Those are only a few things that the forests do for us. Uh, ecosystem services and forests are unmatched. There are plenty. Uh, now if we look at resources, there are also a ton of resources that we get from forests. Uh, things such as plants that we use for medicine or food, uh, animals, or obviously the most valuable thing that we get from forests would be uh, lumber that we use for wood. However, that does lead to a problem that we're going to get into later on how to conserve those trees because trees have to grow and there are only so many trees. So we need to figure out how to weigh uh, our use of that resource. Okay, now let's take a look at forest loss. So uh, there's something known as deforestation. So basically, that's just the clearing and loss of forests, uh, and this promotes desertification, so it's not a good thing. However, uh, at times, it is necessary to some degree. Say, if you're uh, a third world country trying to make itself more advanced and modern, you're going to need to clear some of that natural forest so you can feed people and get resources. It's just how it happens. It happened in America. It happens in uh, other countries' current day. Um, okay, now let's take a look at primary forest. So a primary forest is basically like the natural uncut version, um, unaffected by humans whatsoever. It's how it al has always been before we were here. That's a primary forest. Uh, comparatively, a secondary forest basically replaces the primary forest. So those are smaller, less developed trees and ecosystems, essentially. And yes, uh, wall forest loss and deforestation and all of these are problems. There are currently international efforts uh, in place to counter these uh, negative effects. Let's take a look at resource management now. So basically that describes the use of strategies to manage and regulate the use of renewable resources. So there are basically three main strategies that we're going to discuss. Uh, the first of which is maximum sustainable yield. Basically what that means in a very general sense is that uh, you aim to achieve maximum amounts of resource extraction without depleting the resource from one harvest to the next. So in this case, um, that theory and that strategy are used to cut trees after trees have undergone the fastest rate of growth, and then after that point, yes, you can harvest them. The next we're going to look at is ecosystem-based management. Basically, uh, in a general sense, that attempts to manage the resource har harvesting so as to ma minimize impact on ecosystems and ecological processes that provide the resource. Okay, so in that sense, um, this allows some logging in areas but overall, the preservation of the ecosystem as a whole. So yes, you're allowed to take some logs, but you don't want to affect the ecosystem negatively. That's basically what the ecosystem-based management uh, approach discusses. Uh, lastly, we have the adaptive management strategy. Basically, uh, that systematically tests different approaches and uh, aims to improve everything over time. So just as that's a very broad definition, um, it's pretty variable as it pertains to force management itself. You could start with, say, a maximum sustainable yield approach and morph it towards a more ecosystem-based management approach and then end up with some kind of hybrid mix by the end. That's the idea. Okay, now let's look at uh, what are known as national forests. So basically, that's public land set aside to grow trees, produce timber, protect water quality, and uh, serve as insurance against a lumber shortage in the future. Uh, so that's basically what national forests are, and the chapter discussed that a lot, so it's important to understand. Okay, let's look at harvesting timber. So there are pretty much three main strategies that we're going to go over. Uh, the first of which is clear cutting. So here's a good uh, visual of clear cutting. The visual in the book is actually uh, a visual I prefer, so you could refer to that, uh, but I'm going to 
in the video look at this one briefly so clear cutting is this first image here that's when you essentially clear cut so all these trees that were in the middle are now cut down and they're no longer there uh, the next uh, different technique that the book goes over is something known as seed tree technique uh, and if you look that's this one right here and so basically uh, a few mature trees are left behind in order to shelter the saplings below and so that the whole ecosystem could in essence uh, repopulate that's what's known as the seed tree method okay and lastly we're gonna look at something known as the selection uh, system which are these two visuals down here uh, so we have group selection and single tree selection so granted they vary but they fit under the same uh, general umbrella uh, you could say so basically, uh, say you could cut a group of more mature trees and uh, fewer uh, smaller trees or more smaller trees, uh, fewer uh, mature trees. It varies. Uh, it's just different techniques that you can use to cut in a, a group selection format. Okay, so now uh, in the similar ballpark, there's something known as the National Forest Management, which was passed in 1976, which we're going to uh, go over quickly. So basically what happened is uh, it required uh, national forests to create plans for renewable resource management. And within there, they had to create multiple use plans, which is uh, something the book discusses and basically is what it sounds like. Uh, the national forest systems had to uh, make plans so that they could be used for both recreation as well as wildlife habitat. So that's something to uh, understand. Okay, let's take a look at fire policy. So down here in the visual and uh, just in general, a forest fire doesn't sound like an inherently good thing. However, that isn't always true. There's something known as controlled burns, which are purposeful uh, forest fires. So basically what these do are they help rid of brush uh, that's very flammable uh, in a controlled way. And so this helps the forest. So instead of having one uncontrollable, unplanned giant forest fire with all this dead brush... Um, it's better to get that brush out in a controlled manner, in a controlled fire, than have it be taken out of hand in a, a natural way, or even an unnatural way, just in an uncontrollable fashion, really. Um, so after, uh, say, a fire occurs, there's something known as salvage logging, which is the removal of dead trees after a fire. The book goes over that term, so just uh, understand it. All right, let's take a look at climate change and sustainable forestry. So uh, we all do know that climate change is bringing on global warming, which in some cases uh, creates a warmer, drier climate. So uh, as you would imagine, this isn't always good for a forest ecosystem as it could create habitat destruction and uh, fires, etc. However, there are certain organizations such as the Forest Stewardship Council that are granting uh, sustainable forest certification to certain areas. And this is the little emblem down here, the FSC. So basically, uh, this is a good organization. They're showing um, recognition to certain areas and places that are using sustainable forest techniques. And uh, pretty much 5% of the world's forests are uh, FSC certified, which is a, a good progressive step. Okay, let's take a look at parks, protected areas, and habitat fragmentation. So we've discussed national parks before, but just uh, briefly, uh, a national park is a publicly held Land uh, protected from resource extraction and development, but open to nature appreciation and some forms of recreation. So think Yellowstone, Yosemite, things of that nature. Uh, there's also something known as a wilderness area, which is basically off limits to development, but open to low impact recreation. Okay, uh, let's take a look at something known as habitat fragmentation, which is something I've uh, hinted at in earlier videos, but uh, we're going to actually discuss here. So basically what habitat fragmentation is, is uh, the splitting of an ecosystem, which uh, thus causes species to evolve separately. So within habitat fragmentation, there are a couple uh, key terms you're going to want to know. Uh, the first of which is edge effect. So the edge effect is basically uh, when a habitat along an edge of any given ecosystem varies from uh, the habitat in the interior. Uh, so that's something to understand. All right, and the second um, main thing I want to go over in habitat fragmentation is something known as the island biogeography theory. So basically, uh, that's this entire visual here. So you can refer to that one or the one in your book. It's a little simpler, a little easier to follow, but uh, they cover the same concepts. So basically, uh, this theory goes over that uh, a farther an island lies from uh, a continent, the fewer species tend to find and colonize it. Thus, remote islands host a few species, because of low immigration rates. This is known as the distance effect. Uh, the second part of the theory is that larger islands have a higher immigration rate because they present fatter targets and uh, for dispersing organisms to encounter.
And then the third is uh, larger islands have lower extinction rates because more space allows for larger populations, which are less likely to drop to zero by chance. Uh, so that basically covers the island biogeography theory, uh, and you can follow this on the visual. You can see the large islands, the close islands, the small islands, the far islands, and how they relate to everything I just read. Okay, now let's briefly go over something known as a corridor. Uh, essentially, a corridor is, uh, think of an actual hallway or a corridor in real life, is uh, a corridor that allows animals to travel between habitats. So say a habitat has been fragmented, um, animals and of the same species or different species can still interact, thus uh, they don't uh, evolve separately. And something to always keep in the back of your head is that climate change threatens all of this, which is very, very scary and a very real threat. Okay, uh, conclusion. So forests are very, very complex but important ecosystems. Uh, and unfortunately, climate change and human interaction uh, threatens these ecosystems themselves. Okay, uh, chapter 13 is what we're going to look at next time. The urban environment creating livable and sustainable cities. All right, see you next time.